great to be here and uh, <clears throat> amongst a slightly different crowd that I'm, kind of I'm used to. But um, I want to talk really about uh, some of the new developments that are happening uh, in drug development for this disease. Um, let's just move this forward. So, you know, if you have a look at trials.gov, you'll see that there are quite a few studies now looking at multimodality therapy and a number of these treatments include immunotherapies, chemoimmunotherapies, as I've just illustrated for a couple of these. And what I'm gonna do is really give some background to the evidence that's led to the, uh, the, the use of these agents uh, in standard practice. Some of the newer trial data that's emerging and uh, we'll do this in the front line, the relapse setting, and I'll finish by talking a little bit about some of the new biology that's hopefully going to yield, we hope, an EGFR or ALK-like inhibitor for this disease uh, in the very near future. So if you look at the last 20 odd years, you can see here the uh, evolution of frontline uh, therapy. Um, I'm gonna really focus on the 2003 and the 2021 trials here. You can see the difference in overall survival in these randomized phase three studies is really quite marginal. The first, of course, was the emphasis study. This was looking at pemetrexed um, and cisplatin versus cisplatin alone, hazard ratio 0.77. And if we move forward now almost 20 years, we can see for ipilimumab and nivolumab, hazard ratio 0.74, slightly uh, better increment overall um, for overall survival. The two trials in between actually were, first of all, a, um, a second antifolate study. This was in 2005, conducted by the ERTC. This really just recapitulated what we saw and we're expecting, I guess, with emphasis. Um, and the 2016 study, unfortunately, wasn't licensed, but this was a French study using an anti-angiogenic agent uh, called bevacizumab, which when combined with standard chemotherapy improves survival with this hazard ratio. I'm not gonna focus on those two. I'm really gonna talk about what we're doing today, which is immunotherapy as our first line um, go-to schedule of therapy. Now this um, kind of summarizes the timeline for trials that have really uh, shaped what we're doing today in, in the frontline setting. Um, I just want to point out the first study actually used a very similar drug to the one we use today. This is tremolumumab. Um, this targets a, 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 an immune checkpoint called CTLA-4. We currently use ipilimumab, um, but it does the same thing. And this was a global study, phase three trial, called DETERMIN, which was robustly negative, placebo-controlled, double-blind phase three study, which was <coughs> negative, almost ended uh, immunotherapy, I think, in this disease setting. Um, but then there was a paper which was emerging around about the same time, which was looking at pembrolizumab single agent in the relapse setting. This is the Keynote 28 study. And this showed not only responders, people having partial responses with this uh, immunotherapy, targeting PD-L1, or PD-1 rather, um, but actually very good durability um, of the responses, somewhere around about a year or so. Now, a number of trials have emerged since then, and what I really want to talk about is this one. This is the Checkmate 743 study. Now, this was a study that compared standard chemotherapy, as I've shown you, the emphasis data from 2003, uh, versus ipilimumab and nivolumab. Overall, the trial, of course, was positive, and you can see here the difference, really only a couple of months uh, difference in overall survival, 14 versus 18 months, with this hazard ratio. It's when we drill down, though, into the um, precise outcomes for the histological subgroups that we can see where most of this benefit is coming from. Um, if you look down towards the histology, epithelioid and non-epithelioid, you can see that pretty much all of this benefit that is coming over and above the chemotherapy is coming from the non-epithelioid population. And this is not happening due to a superiority of the immunotherapy's effect in this uh, subtype of mesothelioma. It's due to the inferiority of the chemotherapy. These non-epithelioid mesotheliomas have a phenomenon known as EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition. This is a, a plasticity, a, a change that happens in the, in the disease that makes it more invasive and drug uh, resistant and so on. And it's because of this drug resistance that we see chemotherapy working much worse. So in fact, when you look at the hazard ratio in Checkmate 743, it was something like 0.49 hazard ratio for overall survival, hugely better outcomes for immunotherapy in that subgroup. Putting it all together, you get the net effect of benefit. But actually, if you look at the data comparing chemotherapy to immunotherapy in those patients, 
with um, time to progression as the endpoint, it's six months. It's six months, whether it's chemotherapy or immunotherapy in the majority of patients with epithelioid disease. So what's been happening since, if we look to lung cancer as an area that's moving at a slightly faster rate, uh, we can see that the standard of care now is to combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy. It seems like a sort of simple empirical you know, thing to do, just combine two treatments that works. But actually the science behind this is really quite rational. You know, chemotherapy, when it damages DNA, um, what it does is it liberates cytosolic DNA. Uh, DNA should not be in the cytosol. When it is, it triggers an SOS signal, an ancient SOS signal, which involves what we call sting gas signaling. This brings in immune cells, and therefore you get a, a synergy between the uh, immunotherapy and the chemotherapy. And this IN227 study was combining pembrolizumab, or Keytruda, single anti-PD-1 agent, uh, with chemotherapy, and this was shown in a randomized study, the triplet being superior to the uh, doublet. And you can see that, the, again, the difference here is not enormous. We're not curing patients. Um, this is an expensive form of therapy, and uh, we will see whether or not NICE you know, approves a treatment like this in terms of the cost-benefit uh, dimension. So this brings us to where we are today. Um, we've opened a study in the UK now that's looking at a new form of immunotherapy. Uh, this is called Volrostimig. It's a bispecific antibody. So if you imagine now re-engineering two treatments into one, where the antibody can bind both PD-1 and CTLA-4. The advantage of this, if you see on the right, is that, well, of course, you know, immunotherapy has toxicities. And many of you may be aware that, you know, for example, diarrhea can be really quite profound in some patients or rashes or other um, immunotoxicities. Um, this is because, of course, the drug can have a bystander effect outside of the tumour. And when you have this bispecific, what you're doing is essentially targeting um, a, a sort of a landscape where the two targets, the molecules, are very close together. And this is really in the cancer. So the idea here is that you uh, have better targeting, lower toxicity through targeting the cancer. So this is what it's done in non-small cell lung cancer. We were very impressed by this data that was published in ESMO a couple of years ago. And you can see on the right that if you take chemoimmunotherapy, this is the standard pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy, that's the curve on the left. You add this bispecific to chemotherapy, you get the curve on the right with a, a very decent uh, progression-free survival um, hazard ratio. So the hope was that we could do this in uh, mesothelioma. We could look at this new agent. This is the Evolve study, just getting open worldwide. Uh, we're looking at about 20 countries. Uh, UK is open. Cambridge is, uh, is now re uh, re recruiting, as are we in Leicester, and uh, we'd be very happy to take any patients. I'll just give that plug. Um, this is a sort of one-to-one -one randomization, actually looking at um, immunotherapy, which will be essentially the standard arm in the UK, versus chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, immunotherapy being the borostomic. And these are the centers that we plan to open in the UK, and I'm hoping we can, we can lead globally on recruitment. So what about the relapse setting? Um, what do we do once these patients have progressed? As I say, for immunotherapy, on average, only six months after having ipilimumab and nivolumab. Well, this came before, really, the new standard of care in the front line, but this study I'll just talk about briefly has shown that we can, in this very difficult setting, uh, still achieve um, improvements in outcomes. And this was a, a CIUK-funded study that we did, a placebo-controlled double-blind study. Um, we can see here that hazard ratio was around 0.6-something uh, for PFS. Um, overall survival in the initial result we published in Lancet Oncology was uh, very significant, actually at 0.71 hazard ratio. Um, the NHS, in their wisdom during COVID, decided to offer this to everybody in the UK, and uh, we uh, not sort of surprisingly had crossover in the uh, later analysis, um, which limited somewhat our um, uh, confidence limits for the overall survival, but nevertheless uh, showing good benefit with some people gaining significant uh, tumor regression and symptom control. This study, um, which I will show you very briefly, is a, uh, an important study, not one that is licensed, um, nor a phase three trial, but one of the few studies that have shown a marked improvement in overall survival in the relapse setting. So this is using an old drug, gemcitabine, combining it with ramasurumab. This was the Italian RAIM study. And in this trial, you can see on the right significant 
um, improvement in overall survival. There are some patients in the UK who have civil claims um, from the high courts that allow them to get off-label treatment. And certainly this is in the armamentarium, I think, of most oncologists that you know, have the opportunity to offer this to patients in the UK. And then finally, a drug that can be used um, in UK practice. Uh, we completed a study, a randomized study, called VIM, which was looking at oral vinorelbine. Um, hazard ratio is about 0.6 um, for uh, progression-free survival. Um, overall survival was not significant, but this was not powered to look at that. It was really uh, progression-free survival. We've been um, publishing some work, actually, around biomarkers that might predict the susceptibility of mesotheliomas. And uh, what we found is that BAP1, this very common mutation, uh, when it's mutated, actually confers resistance to antimitotics. And therefore, there may be a personalized strategy that we can use where in BAP1 wild-type patients, this is where we're expecting to see most of the benefit. So finally, um, just looking to the future, what uh, could be out there? What in the future could be, you know, perhaps combined with surgery or um, used to, to dramatically improve outcomes for patients um, alone? Well, um, this is a, a, a very new treatment called a TED inhibitor. Um, this EMT that I was talking about, uh, this phenomenon where cells become more invasive and very aggressive, is perhaps part of the natural history of mesothelioma. Uh, we know about sarcomatoid mesothelioma as being very aggressive. Well, I won't go into detail, but some of the work that we've been doing and others shows that this is a transformation, a process by which epithelioid mesotheliomas evolve. So they evolve to become um, sarcomatoid. And the TED transcription factor is part of that process. So this goes into the nucleus and sets off a number of genes which are very aggressive and include you know, drug resistance genes and this sort of thing. So if you switch off TED, the idea is that you might be able to um, kill these mesotheliomas. If you see in B here, um, these are NF2 mutant mesotheliomas, very common mutation. And you can see these curves dropping off very steeply with a TED inhibitor, whereas the uh, graph adjacent to that on the right uh, shows general relatively lack of activity, um, suggesting this is what we call a synthetic lethality, where the mutation dictates the sensitivity. Now, the first in human data was uh, only reported last year in Florida, AACR. And you can see on the right the uh, um, waterfall plot that was, was reported. And in that waterfall plot, there were patients who had deep responses, who had NF2 wild type. These were not mutated patients. And you had patients who were resistant, uh, who had mutation of the NF2, suggesting that the biomarker strategy is wrong, that there's something else that's governing sensitivity. And I think part of the effort now is to see whether or not we can detect what that is so that we can take these tablet therapies and hopefully get everybody on the right of that waterfall. Uh, this is a trial that's now open in the UK and we're accepting, obviously, uh, uh, recruitment in Leicester. I think Marsden will be opening as well very shortly. And this is something that um, may get us a little bit closer to EGFR-like therapy, I hope. Uh, one of the challenges in mesothelioma is that we're dealing with not gain-of-function mutations, but loss-of-function mutations. These are anti-cancer genes that are essentially being snipped away and taken out of the genome. So what we have to do is to work out what becomes a vulnerability in the cancer when this happens, when you lose a gene. You know, what takes over and what can we therefore go after as a target? So... Many of you will be aware that in mesothelioma, there's an extremely common alteration that happens called uh, CDKN2A. Uh, others uh, you know, can call it P16, the protein is lost. This is a break on cell cycle. When you lose it, cells proliferate like crazy. And we know that patients with P16 mesothelioma, negative mesothelioma, have much more aggressive cancer. So what happens when you have this mutation called MTAP, which is very close to CDKN2A, is that you end up having a metabolite that goes to the roof. It binds to a protein called PRMT5. And what I'm showing you here is a drug which only binds the MTA-bound PRMT5. This is a special form of this protein that only occurs in mutant mesotheliomas. And on the right, you can see um, responses now in the mesothelioma uh, in response to this tablet. And also you can see on the bottom left, you know, quite dramatic regressions, not stabilizations, but regressions of mesothelioma. 
So there's the Marathi drug, which I'm showing you here, that was published in Cancer Discovery recently. We'll be getting access to uh, another agent, hopefully from Amgen later this year, that does very similar thing, almost identical in its mode of action. I guess what we're seeing here, therefore, is a drug that has a potentially very high therapeutic index, one that allows you to target specifically a protein in the context of a mutation, and not only a protein, but a protein that is modified because of that mutation, giving it specificity. So this is an exciting development and uh, quite a rare one, I think, uh, certainly targeting tumor suppressors. One approach we've had with all of these new treatments emerging is to see if we can uh, do uh, what we call personalized therapy trials, where we do multiple biomarker testing, and then we apply a drug for that specific biomarker. So if a patient comes to us with cancer A, we give them drug A, etc. So we've already uh, tested this hypothesis with something called MIST. Sorry, Rajai. I think you had missed as your uh, much more famous uh, um, uh, trial. We, we had a, a smaller uh, umbrella study actually called MIST. We had five arms. Um, we were able to demonstrate actually that using targeted therapies, we can measure efficacy um, in these small phase two studies. One of them um, was sufficiently positive for a so-called PARP inhibitor that we've taken it out to a randomized trial. So it's a nice way to screen for these hypotheses. This is what's coming. We have um, first arm ready to go, uh, hopefully next quarter, of an MDM2 inhibitor in a particular mutational setting. And the idea here is that we take an idea from the clinic, we accelerate it into the, um, sorry, from the lab, accelerate that into the clinic, but then we take information from these tissues to try and better understand why a patient is responding or not responding. So this is just a little bit more detail here. You'll be aware that P53, the guardian of the genome, is a real master tumor suppressor. It's usually repressed, actually, rather than mutated in mesotheliomas. And if we can disrupt that repression um, by disrupting the uh, MDM2 P53 interaction, we can activate this tumor suppressor, activate this really important protein, and hopefully suppress or kill the cancer. So we're testing this idea with an oral inhibitor um, as the first arm, but we have uh, other ideas. Uh, for example, uh, BAP1, very common mutation. Uh, we can target this with a drug that's already out there for treating leukemias, um, a DNMT1 inhibitor called decitabine, uh, or a variant of that. So many of these examples exist. A lot of them are very promising, but can we evaluate these rapidly in small phase twos? And the answer is yes, using um, platforms like Select. So in summary, um, combination immunotherapy is now the standard of care for patients with mesothelioma. And the combination with chemotherapy is the next step in that uh, trajectory in terms of improving outcomes. I think the important thing to note is that immunotherapy is no better than chemotherapy for patients with epithelioid disease. All this benefit with immunotherapy is really seen compared to chemotherapy in the non-epithelioid. But hopefully with the combination with chemotherapy in studies like Evolve, we'll be able to push the, the bar forward actually for, um, for epithelioid mesothelioma. And so um, chemotherapy with immunotherapy from the IND-227, we have to wait to see what happens if the FDA approve and NICE approves, then that may actually come in as a frontline standard sooner rather than later. The relapse setting is an area where now we have randomized trial data to suggest that we can improve outcomes and uh, we should hopefully see more randomized trials in this setting to improve survival outcomes for patients. And then finally, uh, the biology uh, of mesothelioma. Our knowledge is increasing exponentially and it's with that new knowledge that we have drugs like the Marathi uh, PRMT5, MTA, PRMT5, that I've shown you uh, that we may be able to, again, finally achieve something akin to what we're seeing with alkali GFR inhibitors in this disease. So that's my talk. I'd like to thank all my colleagues and collaborators, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.